Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast. I'm your host, Aristide, from Metabolism of Cities. In this podcast, we interview thinkers, researchers, activists, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our cities and how to reduce their environmental impact in a socially just and context-specific way. Today's episode is special. Today we celebrate the 30th episode of the Circular Metabolism podcast, and for that I'm wearing my favorite shirt. Uh, and over these 29 episodes, I spoke and learned with so uh, well. I learned from very intelligent people, much more than I am, and how to move forward from our current mess. I talked about urban ecology, uh, urban metabolism, circular economy, social ecology, degrowth, post-growth, and today we're going to talk about another fascinating topic that might become our compass for the numerous challenges that cities face. But today is also special because I get to talk with the fantastic Kate Raworth. Uh, although we've never talked before, I know already we have some things in common, and one of them is our love for donuts, as it was my favorite treat when I was a kid uh, uh, and I grew up in Greece. So the other ones you're going to discover uh, later on in the episode. To talk about donuts, I have the author of the international bestseller book, uh, Donut Economics, uh, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist, uh, which has been translated into more than 20 languages. Uh, Kate is an economist and, and over the past 25 years has worked for with Oxfam, UNDP, the Ministry of Trade and Industry of Zanzibar, and she currently teaches at the Oxford University and the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. Kate is also the co-founder of the Donut Economics Action Lab, an online collaborative laboratory that brings together tools and stories about how to transform this radical idea into transformative action. With all that being said, thanks a lot, Kate, for being part of this uh, podcast. My pleasure and happy, very happy to join you on the 30th edition. Uh, for the people that perhaps do not know you, live under a rock, could you perhaps give a short introduction of who you are and what you do? Sure. So, um, gosh, I studied economics at university. It turned out to be not what I needed. I walked away. There was climate breakdown, financial meltdown. An economist started saying, oh, we need to rewrite economics to reflect financial realities. And I thought, really? Are we only going to rewrite economics for that? And I came back towards economics and wanted to be part of the movement of people who are flipping it on its head and starting economics with the values that we hold dear. How about the rights of all people? How about the integrity of this one living planet? So I drew a picture that looked like a donut. See, the only difference between us is you actually ate them. I don't eat them. The only donut that's any good for us is, is, is the one it's conceptual. Um, yeah, and I and I published it as a book that you just shared, and I have to say it's had so much more traction in the world than I could have ever possibly imagined, which tells me people are hungry for change and are looking for transformation. So I believe these are the times. Yeah, yeah, and uh, well, it's uh, I can imagine very uh, well weird or difficult to 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 live amongst this uh, uh, you know traction. I mean, as you say, people are hungry, and you, you said it from the get-go, this is an image, uh, and more than just words, we need images, and we don't need to be against something, we need to be drawn into something else. Uh, so you have plenty of uh, circles or donuts behind you as well. What, what is so attractive about this image? I even have one right here on the stick. <laughs> the benefits of lockdown, right? You have everything on a stick. Um, <laughs> So, so the, the donut is like a compass for human prosperity in the 21st century. It's one way of envisioning the future of the world we want. So if you imagine humanity's use of Earth's resources, since we're here talking about metabolism, the use of Earth's resources radiating out from the center, it means the hole in the middle is a place where people are left falling short on the essentials of life. It's where people don't have the resources they need for health and education, food and housing, income, transport, connectivity, political voice and equality. Leave nobody in the hole. Fine. But as we bring everybody out of the hole, there's also an outer limit here. Don't go over this ecological ceiling because that is the way we collectively start to put so much pressure on this planet's life supporting systems that we begin to kick our planetary home out of balance. That's where we cause climate breakdown and we acidify the oceans. 
we create a hole in the ozone layer, we cause critical loss of biodiversity and break down the web of life. So in the simplest of terms, the goal of the donor is to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. And the first thing it does actually is, is transform the shape in our minds of what we think progress looks like. Because the 20th century told us in every economics textbook and every political speech and every, on the, the pages of the newspapers, here we are, this was the shape of progress. <laughs> You have all Every, your props ready I for it. I have all my toys. <laughs> hey, if you're going to be locked down in your office for a year, you might as well have some toys. So there's never-ending growth. It goes to the ceiling, off the screen, up through the ceiling. Nobody asks what happens when we hit the ceiling and go through. This was the shape of progress. And we need to transform that. And that's what the goal, the, do, the donut is part of. And as you just said, you know, it's one thing to protest and critique what's wrong, what's wrong with the old, what's wrong with GDP, fine. But we're never going to transform the world by critiquing things. As Buckminster Fuller said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So I think of the diagrams that I was taught in my economics textbooks. I think of them like intellectual graffiti. Very hard to scrub out. So stop scrubbing. <laughs> Let's paint them over with an amazing mural of something actually better. And that's the power of pictures. They give us a new worldview, and that's what the donut aims to do. And I think when I first drew the donut diagram back in 2012, it was published in the run up to the Rio Plus 20 conference mm -hmm. on sustainable development. And so many people said to me, you know, I've always thought of sustainable development like this. I've just, I've just never seen the picture. And I could see that it was empowering to people to have a picture in the hand, to have something to point to, to feel that they could visualize this vision of the world they wanted to create. And that's what drove me to, to leave my job at Oxfam and write the book as the most effective act of advocacy I could do at the time. Yeah, and especially, I think, uh, so you, you mentioned, I think, uh, I don't know if it was in Rio or in another summit, where a lot of people had this balance um, conception of life, uh, like Pachamama and all of that. But then some other people said, well, this, this is wishy-washy, we need, like, evidence-based models and you kind of reconciled with two words the 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 spiritual word and the uh, analytical words um and i think well was it two three years ago that the planetary boundaries concept was or was it in 2008 i don't remember so it came out really recently just before that right so really recently as like so i have some dinosaurs behind me right so we've got long time in the room so yes humanity's beginning to understand the dynamics of this incredible, delicately balanced living planet on which we depend is really recent. The Planetary Boundaries work was published first in 2009. Yeah. It's only a decade. <laughs> like These guys over here will tell you that's tiny, nothing. It's only a decade that humanity's begun to say, oh, what, what might be the life supporting systems of this planet? I mean, if you, if you think that humanity for over a thousand years has investigated the dynamics of the living body and understood that our bodies have complex systems, the respiratory system, digestive system, muscular system, nervous system, and that our health depends on staying within balance, have enough food, but not too much, have enough temperature, but not too much, enough oxygen, but not too much, enough exercise, but not too much. Life thrives in balance. And if we can take what we know from our bodily health, and take that now to planetary health, which is a science only a decade old in that sense. We're just at the beginning of this journey. So yes, it was actually in the run up to the Rio Plus 20 conference that somebody said to me, go and present your diagram to all the embassies of the negotiating countries at Rio, which was a very strange experience. I went to New York and, and had meetings at all these embassies. And what did I have to show them? A picture of a donut. And I went in there thinking, are they gonna think I'm crazy? And I remember the Argentine, uh, the Ar Argentina was the head of the G77 at the time. And the Argentine representative who I showed it to, she was this very powerful negotiator. And I remember thinking, what is she going to think? And she said, I have always thought of sustainable development like this. She said, go and show this to the Europeans. I want to know what they think. And the next day I had a meeting with the, the European group of uh, people from lots of different countries. And I was in there and they pulled down their whiteboard. Right, what have you got to show us today? <laughs> projected on the wall, uh, it's a donut. And one of the, the people there, actually an English guy, I remember he, he said, oh, 
He says, yeah, you know, the, the, the Latin Americans, they talk about this Pachamama. He did this. He went, this Pachamama, <laughs> like we're fluffy, fluffy, you know. But he said, but, but, but I see that this is a, a kind of Western way of saying the same thing. And that was actually a really powerful point he'd made. I hadn't realized that this shape of two circles was connected to a worldview of Pachamama or yin yang or the Buddhist endless knot or the Celtic double spiral. I mean, there are indigenous symbols from all over the world that echo this shape of dynamic balance. I hadn't realized that, but he made a very profound point that if we connect through shape, sometimes words and labels and mm. jargon and terminology totally gets in the way. But a shape goes deeper somehow into our conscious and and we think yeah uh, that's that's balance that's health so yes it's fascinating how we can use the power of shape to bridge and otherwise divide yeah yeah for sure i mean i think it it really helps to explain as well i mean uh when we talk about urban metabolism it's a metaphor circular mm. economy it's a mm. metaphor things are I mean, I, I think they also draw it interdisciplinarity because they're easily understood. Like a metaphor is kind of a, a collaboration lubricant, if you will, of different disciplines that kind of see the same thing, but in a different way. So they have their own uh, knowledge, their own a priori, if you will. And they say, okay, yeah, I can understand this from... And out of nowhere, you have collaboration, like the Argentinian and the... English person could collaborate out of nowhere because never before they would say, oh yeah, let's work on balance, <laughs> right? Um, so Yes, and let me just pick you up on that. So uh, as you say, you use a metaphor in your work and it's a beautiful example that, in fact, we live by metaphors. Hang on, where is it? Um, this is one of my favorite books. Uh -huh. I don't know if you know it. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're it writing an article about, on metaphors right now. It's funny, yeah. There we go. So metaphors are profound in language because the world is really complex and we're not actually often trained and taught to see the complexity of Earth's dynamic systems and society's dynamic systems. And so to help us understand them, we use metaphors. Well, it's a bit like this. Think of it like that, right? And we use that throughout human language. And that's what this book does. And, you know, one of, one of the most powerful metaphors is the idea that forwards and up is good. Yeah. Why are you looking so down? Did you have a <laughs> setback? Cheer up. Things may be moving forward, right? So forward and up is good. No wonder we love economic growth so easily. Forward and up is good, right? But the metaphor that you use, I think is a brilliant one, metabolism, because it's, it's bringing us back to this question of bodily health. My bodily health depends upon me having a healthy metabolism and recognizing that I'm a I'm an open system. I have inputs and outputs and a through flow that supports my well-being. Now, you're precisely taking from what we understand at the level of bodily health, and you're now using that metaphor to understand urban health. And people can go, oh, I get that. It's like an organism. It has a through flow. And we need to think about the quality of that food and where it's going. So it's a really lovely way, again, of using our, our intuitive almost understanding of our bodily health and taking that to another level. But it's funny because, so I, I'm wondering what you think about this. So in urban metabolism, we have many streams of understanding or schools of thought. Like we have the people that are part of the urban ecology stream, other parts of the political ecology, others are called more from the industrial ecology. So, you know, wh whatever that is, but there are different intellectual families within it. And yes. they don't, so they create boundaries, uh, sorry, islands of knowledge, uh, and, you know, they're not very collaborative sometimes. And with circular economy, I feel it's a bit the same. So there is now like a family of circular economy that's extremely pro-growth. There is another one that's extremely technical and let's figure out the waste regulations. There is another one. Let's start by closing the tap first and then we'll figure out how to, you know, bring the water back to the sink, let's say. Um, but in donut economics, there is no such... Um, it, I don't know, it seems so clear that there's no division or perhaps it's, is it too young to, to have divisions uh, or uh, many times it's because there's a lack of a, of a definition, a good definition that everybody agrees on. Yet for the donut, I think that everybody agrees on or it's very clear, you said what it is. Uh, 
and I don't think we can argue with the definition, right? Well, the definition of the donut, I mean, this is the goal. <laughs> I mean, you can argue about what is good food, how much is enough. You can argue about where these planetary boundaries are. And that's an ongoing conversation, I think. But it, it claims that's that's what we're aiming to do. And then there are, there are principles and dynamics for getting there. We need to go from degenerative design to regenerative. And the circular economy will be a part of that. We need to go from divisive economies to distributive economies that are far more equitable. I think I'm going to be I'm going to be honest. I think donut economics may still be too young for those divisions to open up. One of the areas you just said some people in pro, in, in circular economy are really pro growth, and I think yeah I think there's a real risk that some of the most powerful ideas get captured by a very mainstream and familiar business mindset that still is in service to growth and assumes that growth can and should and will be endless and that the purpose of business is to reap financial return. And then there's a whole other field of people saying, well, no, the business is a really great vehicle and, and means by which to transform our economies. And maybe business, yeah, of course, business needs to make a profit. Otherwise it can't open the doors next week and next month and next year, but it's not here to make profit. The profit is a condition in order to serve the purpose. And what we're trying to do is transform our economy and create a circular economy. I meet people on both sides of that divide. And both of them might be doing, say, I'm doing circular economy. I'm using circular economy because it's great for our profit margins. We're saving so much and we've entered new markets. And someone else saying, we're doing circular economy because this is how to transform the economy. And that's what we're in service of. We're using business as a vehicle. Totally different designs. And I think people coming with a very different goal. Now, they could try and do that around donut economics, but we've actually been very, very careful with the donut because we think the greatest risk to it is indeed greenwash. And so we have, a, right now, we have a pretty strict condition around business. We say, businesses, you are welcome to use the donut. If you go to our platform, donuteconomics.org, there is a tool there called When Business Meets the Donut. It is a tool that you could use as a workshop in your company. It's a tool for internal reflection. And there's a lot of it that needs to be done in lots of companies. What you can't do is stick it on your website, stick it in your marketing, go and talk about it publicly because this is not about running around saying we're doing the donut. It's far, that's just about branding. If you want to use it, use it internally. In the future, we're going to be, we're in fact, we're hiring right now to yep. bring somebody into our team to be our business lead. And in the future, we're going to open that box and start working with different kinds of enterprises. And, and I'm really happy to talk more deeply about the different kinds of enterprises, but it's really important for these ideas, be it circular economy or be it donut economics, not to get captured by mainstream business that wants to extend its life and will grab the latest toy gadget cool idea and just swallow it up for breakfast spit it out talk about metabolism the metabolism of using up great ideas and move on to the next one and destroy them in the process so we say when a disruptive idea meets business as usual i when the donut meets mainstream business something's going to get transformed mm -hmm. and our job is to make sure it's not <laughs> so we set a very high bar for engaging with companies yeah, I, I was. That's also like where when I was seeing all of the, the use and the adoption of donut economics by governments, uh, by cities, uh, and now with all of this, I, I'm so uh, afraid that this is going to happen. This greenwashing is going to happen, and all of this. And but of course, well, at least you have your hands dirty. You you're there. You're doing the thing. You're defending the concept because there is a person behind it. In, in many others concepts as well you know it's get thrown around and um re reappropriated by different people and and it's no one's well of course you you don't i think you you want you, you did this for the world and not for yourself uh this concept uh and so i i also imagine that you're very happy that people appropriate this concept but uh, i can imagine how you know, difficult it must be that you, you see other people holding your, or, you know, uh, torturing your own baby sometimes and you're like, yeah, but that's not what I thought at the beginning. So it's a really interesting challenge and dance that we're making. We, we launched Donut Economics Action Lab because when my book came out in 2017, I would give a talk and then afterwards there'd always be a little cluster of people who say, yeah, but I'm actually doing this. I'm teaching this in my classroom. I'm, I'm discussing this in the board in my company. Uh, I'm taking this to the town hall. I'm bringing this to the mayor. We're doing this in our community. So people wanted to do it. And it made it clear to me that, okay, 
this is asking for an organization. This is asking to bring these change makers together so they can connect, learn from each other and be inspired by each other. And so I found a co-founder, Carlotta Sands, and we set up Donut Economics Action Lab. It's an online platform. Anybody can join, any individual can join and become a member. There are tools, we put them all in the commons. So anybody can use these tools. So they can't appropriate them, I hope, but they can use them and adapt them and apply them. And we ask that in return for us sharing these ideas openly, we ask for the human quality of reciprocity that you share back. If you make an innovation with them, you share it back. If you have an experience using them, you share it back as a story. So that's the openness. Now we have to balance that with integrity, that you can't just take it and do anything with it. You can't take out the social foundation and put business needs <laughs> and interests in the middle. You can't use it to, we, we actually say you can't use it to declare a new kind of capitalism because actually we think that's lazy and we need to really deeply ask ourselves what are the structures that underlie what we call capitalism because those are, should be up for changing too. So we want to use it to deeply challenge and question our economies. So we're constantly balancing openness with integrity and that business policy I just told you about is the, is the tightest line of integrity that we've got. But yes, cities and places are, are using it sometimes, calling us up and saying, we'd like to work with you. Sometimes we found out on Twitter that they've adopted the donut as their yeah. city goal. <laughs> so it's like, okay, how, how are you going to be doing this? And, and we're in a dance of, at the moment, working with that principle of high trust, trusting that people and, and these are often city councillors or deputy mayors are they're putting themselves out there adopting this concept uh they're pushing the ambition of their place and we trust their intention now they may then be working in a context that wants to rub the corners off it that wants to soften it that, and we will work with them in that context and say what does it mean to hold yourself to the standard of the donut what are your indicators and are you going to show year on year that you're coming into the donut for example, I know that the city of Amsterdam, which adopted the donut in April 2020, in the height of the COVID crisis, I know that in the autumn of this year, they're going to hold themselves to account on it and talk about the state of the donut in the city of Amsterdam. How are we doing? What are we doing? Where are we moving forwards? Where have we not made progress? How are we doing this? And what more must we do? So they're using it as a tool to hold themselves accountable. At Donut Economics Action Lab, we are engaging, listening, watching and learning and trying to figure out exactly how to allow an idea to spread at the speed and scale that this decade and these times require without it getting totally co-opted and therefore degraded and therefore devalued for everybody in the process. And this is hard <laughs> and it's it's fascinating as well. Yeah, no joke. Uh, <laughs> so it's funny because in the, the donut you have different facets. So you have the, the planetary boundaries up above and you, you can choose which ones you want uh, for the social foundation. Um, so they were very linked, if I understand, with the SDGs as well. Um, so in a way, the donut as well is a monitoring system as such, right? By, by its birth, by its representation, it's a monitoring system. It's an indicator system. Um, so that is already fantastic because we know, are you within or out of the donut, right? So that, that is already fantastic. And then I think your colleague Andrew and Dan O'Neill and Julia also did this for the, for all the countries in the world. And they saw that no country is actually within the donut, if I remember well. And I think yes. the closest one was Vietnam or Costa Rica. I don't remember. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, and you know, I, I read the book and at the end I was, okay, this is a vision, this is a monitoring tool, but what are the actions? Where, you know, how do we get inside of it? So there are the seven ways, of course, but, you know, give me a simple action or, you know, and, and then I thought, ah, okay, that's why they did the deal, the, the, the Donut Economics Action Lab. It's called Action Lab. So I thought, okay, that's <laughs> right. Uh, so I said, okay, that's the logical uh, continuation of the book, right? We have an idea, we have an action lab, and the actions are proposed by people and we share the experience. But can you foresee, for instance, uh, by working with a territory, with uh, a business or whomever, to, to develop like a donut action plan? Uh, how would that would look like? Or how would you go about this? Because it's not just putting all of these one next to the other, it's the complex interlinkages, like 
you reduce your in unemployment, but it might degrade, you know, the, the water threshold or I don't know what. You know, it's so complex. How, how do you navigate th through this crazy complexity? So of course, no one knows, no right. But in the don't, and then often when I share, share the don't, I say, hey, by the way, this isn't an answer. It doesn't tell you the answers. There's no equation. There's no magic solution that pops out at the end. It's intended it. as a <laughs> it's intended as a holistic thinking space that enables you to see everything that you need to be taking into account at the same time. And it's complex, and it might seem overwhelming. But you know what? These issues don't go away if we just ignore them. They're still there. They're just bubbling away in the background. So. Yeah, so the, the donut could be a monitoring tool itself. If a city sets or a city or a place sets the what are the levels on the social foundation? Where do we need to be on the planetary boundaries? And year on year on year, are we coming closer or not? But, and, and rather than jumping from that to, okay, what are the policies? To me, it's crucial to focus on the dynamics. What are the big principles that we want to put in practice? And I, and, I, and I wrote Donut Economics as a set of ways to think and principles very intentionally because I was thinking, I'm writing this in 2015. I'm, I'm hoping it's relevant all over the world. So it, it, a policy that might make sense in New York is not the same as a policy that makes sense in New Delhi. So I'm not going to write a set of policies. And also, I want this to be relevant over time. Mm. And, and the world and technologies and regulations and events will change. So I, I wanted to keep it at the level of principles. So two of the big principles that I just named, right? One, we've inherited linear degenerative economies. We take Earth's materials, here's your metabolism. We take Earth's materials, put them into the pipe of production, make things we want, use it for a while, often only once, a plastic cup, and then we throw it away. And that's the linear degenerative economy that we've inherited. Thank you very much, great grandparents for inventing it. It made great wealth for many people, but now the earth is too small and the economy is too big. And we realize this is running down the life support systems of planet earth. So we need to turn this from a linear degenerative economy to a circular, cyclical, regenerative one, where we use earth's resources far more carefully, more collectively, more creatively, and more slowly. And we can call that a circular economy or a regenerative one. And, and I'm not, I don't want to get caught up in the terminology. And I know some of these different schools of thought can get very caught up in it. I think we can lose people that way. You know, we can lose the wider public. It's just too technical. So look, a little piece of postback. We need to use things again and again. Waste from one process becomes food for the next. A million ways in which we can invent that. But we need metrics to know. How would we know if our economy was becoming more circular or not? And actually the city of Amsterdam, having put the donut at the heart of their circularity strategy, are now creating new metrics so that we measure this stuff. Instead of obsessively measuring GDP all the time, we measure this. Are we becoming more, more circular? But there's a second dynamic that really matters. Favorite toy coming here. Uh, uh. We have yes. inherited economies <laughs> that are divisive by design, that, that, ch that channel and capture opportunity and value in the hands of a few, and we call it the rise of the 1%. Globally, the number of billionaires has doubled over the last decade from 1 billion to 2 billion. And we know in many nations through inheritance, through regulation, through law and privilege, opportunity and value are concentrated in the hands of a few. And there's no way humanity can get into the donut if we have economies like this. We need to transform them so that, these become, <laughs> so that these become distributive economies, so that value and opportunity is shared far more equitably with everybody who co-creates it. And that turns out to be everybody. So from degenerative to regenerative, from divisive to distributive. What about a project that says, let's create the metrics to measure that? How would we know if our economy was becoming more regenerative? How would we know if our economy was becoming more distributive? Fantastic 21st century project of the new metrics that we need. And yes, we set up Donut Economics Action Lab to say, let's find out where this action is happening and how it's being put into practice. So I'll give you one example, one of my favorite um, clear action that I think from uh, a government. Uh, Amst the Netherlands has said we're going to be 100% circular by 2050, 50% circular by 2030. I think that's real leadership by a nation. And by the way, why has not every single European Union country done this? I mean, how can that, how, and, and all the rich countries in the world, the, the North America and Canada and, and Australia and New Zealand, how can these nations, which are richer than nations have ever been before, how can we not commit to becoming circular economies? Why has this been left lagging behind the carbon commitments? It, 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 it should be illegal to have not 
already committed that you, of course, your economy must become circular. So Amsterdam has totally taken on this legislation, taken on this regulation, and they're saying from 2023, all built environment tenders must be circular. And from 2022, next year, 10% of city procurement will be circular. What I really like about this is it's got long vision, decadal ambition, but then next year opportunity. If you are a pioneer in the circular economy, we're creating a market for you right now. It also tells all businesses, you are welcome to do business in Amsterdam. But if you want to stick around, you've got to get circular. Otherwise, you're going to have to leave. And, it, and, and, and here's the powerful thing. I think boundaries unleash our creativity. Now, you could talk to any architect, any designer, and they'll tell you that is definitely true. Think of a skateboarder. It's boundaries. It's walls and ledges and edges that give them something to do. It's, it's the tram lines that turn tennis into the game of tennis from game of just whacking a ball around. It's, you know, in football, in every, boundaries are what enable us to get creative inside. So when, this, when a government says, we're gonna be 100% circular by 2050, we're gonna be 50% circular by 2030, and we want built circularity in the, in the built environment in two years time, that unleashes the creativity of architects who may at first think, oh, more regulations, but hang on, once you get over this, you, I, and I know architects in Amsterdam at first, they thought more regulations. We, when they get on top of it, they're like, oh, we're now at the front end of circular building design. We now have got skills and practice and experience that are going to be wanted all over Europe and all over the world. So this is actually, this has pushed us to the front edge. But also what I've noticed is students leaving university, they've studied circularity, mm -hmm. circular materials, circular design, and they leave university and they say, you mean I actually get to do this? It wasn't just a nice fun thing we did in our textbooks and I have to put that away and get back to business as usual. I actually get to do this in my city. So I experience a lot of energy and creativity in that city where the boundaries are clear. And I think it's missing in other places that haven't put those boundaries in. Do yeah. you think that too? I, you, you must be seeing this so much from your work as well. What, what do you think? Do the boundaries, what boundaries have you seen that unleash creativity? No, you're right. I, I think you, it's absolutely as, as well inspiring for people, for researchers to see these targets, right? Of course, we in academia sometimes also get a bit cynical because there are promises, but they're not upheld. Um, and we're a bit, okay, is this the new craze? They're going to say they're going to be X amount circular, but how are they going to possibly do it? Like a city is an open system by design you know a city is we made it over the i don't know how many thousand years so that it's accumulates well things accumulate somewhere else and that enables other people to free up their time to become an artist to become a citizen etc etc so by design cities are open right um which is i guess a fact but how do you make it a how do you close a thing that it's by definition open uh, so, okay, let's, let's get over that. But, um, but then it's okay. That it, that is good, but how do we do things? So I, I helped the, I worked a lot with the region of Brussels. We were, we held a chair on circular economy and urban metabolism. So during their four years of circular economy plan, we were a bit the sparring partner to, to think things through. Uh, that's a difficult tongue twister. Um, and the idea was, okay, but you are now um, funding so many different actions, innovative actions. How do we know that they're circular? And, you know, is there a, a way to define, okay, I, I put that million euros, I got more circular. They, they didn't have this, um, this uh, measurement. And so that's kind of... That was a bit frustrating, I think, for many people to, to know at the end, okay, what have we managed in four years? Did, did this, I think, uh, wonderful activities happen over these four years. I think a lot of people uh, made links. So it was a systemic uh, opportunity to, to collaborate. And a lot of people didn't think that was possible at the beginning and are now motivated to continue. But then it's, okay, but what do we do the next four years? And how much do we need to do more? So we need, I think, quantities help us as well to, to know what are the efforts to be made. Because if we say 50% circular, but what are we today? Are we one, two, five? Uh, so I think these are the, the things that 
of course, that's my job. So this is what gets me excited to, to get these numbers and to then help to, to say, okay, that fits into that number or that doesn't, you know, making a, a green roof is fantastic, but does it make a city more circular or not? What's the definition that we're giving it and all of that. So, yeah, I think that's, that does not answer your question, but yeah. <laughs> And for me, circularity is a part of something bigger, which is regenerative. So mm -hmm. I would say, for example, a green roof is absolutely part of a regenerative city, but it might not be part of the circular use of materials. But let me let me pull back a moment. And, and that's interesting. You worked with Brussels because also it was the Secretary of State of uh, and, and Economic Transition in Brussels, mm -hmm. Barbara Tract. She contacted us and said, I want to bring the donut to my city. And we said, fabulous we're not consultants it wouldn't be yeah. right anyway for us to come to your city we're not from your city find an organization locally uh, that is embedded in part of the civic society she did uh, an organization called confluence mm -hmm. and they over the past year have actually uh, produced the brussels donut and, and they published it quite recently on a, on a, a website brussels.donut really wonderful reports of them exploring what would it mean to do the donut in, in brussels at the at the regional level um, at the level of a neighborhood, at the level of buildings, the level of objects. Really wonderful exploration of that work. Um, where was I gonna go? Uh, oh, I know, yes, yeah, so so the question that we invite any city to ask, and since we're talking Brussels, I'll, I'll, I'll say it in Brussels. Here's the, here's the question, if, if any city says, well, we want to do the donut, what would it mean to do the donut here? Here's what would it mean? We invite you to ask yourself this very ambitious 21st century question. How could your city be a home to thriving people in an ecologically thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet. Now, that's a big question and it's got four parts. The first part is what would it mean for all the people of this place to thrive? So who are all the people of Brussels in their full diversity of the people who've lived there for generations, people who've arrived recently, different cultural histories, their values, what does it mean to people there to thrive? It's gonna be different in Brussels to Barcelona to Bombay, right? It's gonna change. Secondly, what would it mean for your city to thrive ecologically within its natural habitat? And here we draw on the work of the biomimicry thinker, Janine Benyus. If Janine was to come to Brussels, she'd say, right, take me to the wild land next door. Now, I don't know where that is, but I bet there's some wild the land, yep. okay, in the south. So, Let's go to the wildland next door and let's literally take a hectare of this land and ask ourselves, what is nature's generosity here? So how much is nature sequestering carbon on this land? How much is nature housing biodiversity and cooling the air and cleansing the air and storing uh, water after a storm and building soil? And that is nature's generosity here in this place, on this land and this part of the world where your city is based. Now, what if your city aimed to match or exceed the generosity of that wildland next door. How could the city go from releasing carbon to actually storing carbon like the trees do? How could the city store groundwater under the, under the pavements after a storm? How could the city house biodiversity and cool the air so that it becomes functionally indistinct from the wildland next door? I love that because it's wildly but utterly naturally ambitious. So these are local aspirations to be thriving people in a thriving place. And in many of the indexes that are created of the best cities in the world where you could live, it's cities that have that. They have great, you know, they have great housing, great latte coffee bars and great Wi-Fi and a great culture. And there's mountains and trees and the air is clean and we could swim in the rivers. So that's the kind of local aspiration. What these often fail to take account of is what you were talking about, the open system nature of this city's global responsibility, because every city is embedded in intense networks with the whole planet and people worldwide. So we say the other half of this city portrait is to say, how can your city respect the health of the whole planet? So think of the supply chains that bring clothing and food and electronics and construction materials and consumer goods to your city every day, and that stream of waste going out. And that's where we must come back within planetary boundaries. That's the consumption footprint, it's the home of your work, which is so valuable for helping make this visible in numbers and concepts. How can we come back within planetary boundaries? And of course, almost every city in the global north 
is living way over planetary boundaries. So this is a major challenge and, and cities never done this before. They've no. never cut their consumption footprints. They've never cut their carbon footprints. They've never reduced the fertilizer use that goes worldwide into the food that they eat in their restaurants. And then lastly, we say, while we've got you, <laughs> think again of those global <laughs> supply chains of all the, you know, and think of the people. Who stitched and sewed your clothes? Who picked and packed the food? Who assembled your mobile phone and your laptop? Who dug and transported all those construction materials? And are those people's rights respected because they are connected to your city? Now, the last thing I'll say here is that when we produced the city portrait for Amsterdam, this was included, this, this, this global social lens, and it included uh, quotes from, we, so we use global labor supply chain research of products that we know are on sale in your city, whether they're um, computer products or clothing or food, of, and, and academics have done amazing work over the years tracing the supply chains of particular brands all over the world and we can see the conditions of workers so it's on sale in your city here are some of the workers who made those products this is what life is like for them and so it, it includes quotes from female cobalt miner in the democratic republic of congo saying i have aches and pains all over my body or child labor working for one or two dollars a day mining cobalt or a bangladeshi garment worker producing brands that we know are on sale in the city of amsterdam when we first produced this, our colleagues in the city of Amsterdam said, no, 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 this, this <laughs> doesn't feel right. This isn't us. You can't put this in our portrait. And we had a really fascinating conversation with them and saying, listen, you, you're, you're facing up to your ecological portrait, which is shocking to look at. This is the social story that goes with it. It's not yours alone. This is true in every city. It doesn't go away if we hide it. <laughs> of course, this is part of your city story. And, and to my huge respect for them, the city policymakers and the people who now talk about Amsterdam City Portrait have absolutely turned around. You will hear the deputy mayor of, of Amsterdam, Marika van Dornink, telling you, oh, by the way, our city imports cocoa into the port of Amsterdam from across the world, from West Africa, where we know there are modern day slavery conditions on those cocoa farms. This is connected to us. We now recognize we are connected to this problem. And as we are making our port more circular, we must also think about how we tackle that too. So she's embraced it. And once you start facing it, you can start to transform it. I mean, after all, Amsterdam is home to Fairphone, yep. which is aiming to make phones totally different. Choni Chocoloni committed to slave-free chocolate, the Clean Clothes Campaign, campaign for workers' rights worldwide. So it's a city that's already in action about this. So I'm telling you this long story to say that bringing the donut to the city is a complex set of questions. And we create a canvas that we invite people to look at their city through these four lenses. Some people might find it overwhelming. Actually, my experience to date is that the people who we've had in the room or online say, no, this is empowering because we already know these things matter. We already know that they're interconnected and this helps us to visualize them and recognize them and then start to identify, as you said, more employment, but more carbon emissions. In Amsterdam, we want more housing. How do we do that without creating climate change? We need to move to another solution. We need more circularity. We need to be more uh, more social housing. We need to build it differently. And we need to own it differently. So it's these boundaries that people then recognize are triggering innovation. Yeah, and I feel people feel more complete as well that we, we don't put, you know, the inconvenient truth under the carpet yeah. and, you know, we'll just make a, uh, we'll take a bucket of uh, green paint and then we'll paint our city green and everything is going to be nice. So, but that puts, you know, us researchers on a very difficult path to, to figure out the consumption based approach for cities. This is like our nightmare because uh, of the lack of consistent data and all of this. But on the other side, you put politicians on the hot seat, like, look, look, y your responsibility just grew by 90% right now. You, 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 were you thought that you were responsible to this amount of people. Now you're responsible to that amount of people. And it's up to you to, to figure this out. And uh, yeah. And I want to ask you a question because this consumption-based accounting is so important. I can tell you. So, um, so Andrew Fanning and Dan O'Neill and Julia Steinberg and Will Lamb, they did these national donuts. In fact, that's how I first met them. They'd done these amazing downscaling donuts for 150 countries. And they're profound because some of the countries that, so, so I used to work at the United Nations Development Program or the Human Development Report, right? It was my job around the year 2000 on, on the day that the HDI came out 
to go on the road show, radio show of the country that had come at the top. And it was like Norway, Australia, Canada. And I had to go on their talk show radio to, hey, <laughs> we're the best country in the world to live in. And I was so frustrated by this because the Human Development Index reflects health, education, and average income. And these are some of the most environmentally polluting countries in the world, but it wasn't captured there. So I was saying, yes, congratulations. And, and we needed the data to show that actually there's an environmental degradation story behind that high achievement. Now, the Downscale National Donut does it, and it does it visually. Again, coming back to the power of pictures, I tell you, I, I, I now work very closely with Andrew Fanning. He's part of the team at Donut Economics Action. I was so thrilled to have him as part of our team because his work is invaluable. We, I did a presentation for Norway recently. So I take the Norwegian National Donut, which looks very good on the social foundation, but mm -hmm. lots of red <laughs> overshoot. And I show this to Norwegian government officials and you can literally see that that's us. I mean, we're Norway. That, yeah, exactly. <laughs> No, or we're Canada or we're Australia, that's us. And there's this shock. Now it's only possible because of this consumption-based data. So first of all, thank you to you and all the researchers who make this data, which I know is a incredibly fiddly hours, painstaking work, but it, in the end, it literally makes people's jaws drop. It has a huge impact. And so often after a speech, a policymaker will say, when you showed that picture, of our country with that that red overshoot. I mean, you can tell someone's really literally been physically changed inside their sense and therefore their sense of global responsibility as well. So I want to know what you see as this emerging future of the consumption data, because of course at the moment it's we don't have enough of it. Now we're aware of it. We want to downscale it to the city. We can't. Yeah. So I want you to I want you to tell me that we're going to get more. I want you I want you to tell me that this is going to only get better. But but honestly, I, I want to hear from you. Where do you see this work going, and what do you think is most important to bring forward in the consumption based data, in terms of actually having impact in policy? Wow. Well, thanks. <laughs> we're, we're flipping the the interview around now. Uh, well, it's a conversation. Isn't it's it? a conversation. It is. Um, so. So just to, to clear things out for the people listening, consumption-based is looking at everything that's happening from the mining until the consumption, until the waste of one product. And then you have to add it for all of the products of your city. And then that's what we call the consumption-based. And then you have what we call the territorial-based. That's looking at the meters of your house, of all of the houses around you. So you get one direct quantity and one consumption-based quantity. For Brussels, just as a reference, the consumption base is three to four times higher than the territorial one. For energy, materials, for water is 42 times more. So, and that's for agriculture. So it means that in Brussels, becoming vegetarian or vegan is much more important than taking showers instead of baths, right? So that's- You can do both, you can do both. Right? Of course, of course. I'm, I'm telling about priorities. I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> so, why and how is this possible? Brussels is a region at the same time. And luckily in Belgium, we have what we call input-output tables that are regionalized. And we have one for Brussels. So that's like the best case scenario. You have a city and you have its, its table, its input-output table to do it. Now, there is almost no other cities in the world that have an input-output table, except in Australia and things like that where... So... Some of the colleagues of, uh, of um, Julia, and you mentioned him in, in the book, Tommy Vidman and his team in, uh, in Sydney. So they've been doing this for 15 years, 20 years now. Uh, and they've collaborated with the statistical offices there. So they downscaled this to neighborhoods. So they have individual input-output tables for neighborhoods. And I think this is where... It is fantastic because you can see the one neighborhood and compare them and all of that. And that's that's was only possible because they had this very long-term collaboration with the statistical office and then they infiltrated it somehow. You know what I mean? You get to have your colleagues there and they work with you and all of this. So I think this is more or less the future is to understand that we're nowhere near the, the challenge to, to measure this kind of stuff. And then have our students. So, as you said, the, the economic uh, student, the economist of the 21st century, or the environmental people of the 21st century, need 
to have this in their tool belt. They need to know how to do consumption-based. They need to know how to measure stuff. Uh, but this is going to take at least five to 10 years time before we get there, I think. Because these input-output tables are generally produced every five years, more or less. So we always have a delay as well. We only know like five years later what happened with the policy right now. So I hope that this is where we're going to get. We're going to get modest about what we know and what we don't know. And then say, okay, don't, don't, well, we're all data poor in some case, right? There is always, we're never going to have the data that we want. So what can we do with it? What does it say? Let's interpret it. And what are the data gaps in order to, I mean, what should we do in the next five years? So, so data and information should be part of political plans to know about it, to know about the stories, as you mentioned, the, the social stories, because this is even less known, right? We know about the, the, Trans yes. translating economic flows into environmental flows, but the social stories, this is like a a black story, a black box. We 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 know nothing about it. And it could absolutely be known. I mean, if companies wanted us to know, <laughs> oh, you just put a little QR code on every shirt. Um, you know, I could scan scan my shirt and up on my screen would pop a, a, a live webcam from the factory where it was made. Easy. If they wanted me to know, yeah. easy. <laughs> Congrats, uh, so you just like enslaved so many people. <laughs> It's not like it's impossible to, to do. It's the, it's who owns that information, who controls it. But I think it's going to be so important, this consumption-based data, because just as uh, in the climate change negotiations, it's still very much based on territorial emissions and the idea that we should take responsibility for our consumption. Well, some countries will still say, well, that, 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 that goes beyond our, our ability, our limits. But as you see in, in, in climate change, the more that it's possible to do attribution of extreme weather events and connect that to excessive carbon emissions, there are law cases coming right now. Once the information comes, the legal case comes. And I think with consumption-based mm. um, emissions and consumption-based data, once the information comes, I'm not so focusing on the legal cases coming, but rather that the, the moral responsibility and the awareness that this is our ours to act upon and that we can affect it and that we can make a difference. Uh, and we'll see that change in the data. That's that's going to be more and more important. So I'm just really excited about, you say, five, ten years. You know, the dinosaurs are saying, <sighs> blink of an eye. But of course, this is, a, this is an important decade and we need it fast. And I really hope that we'll look back in a decade's time and we'll look back at the national donuts that Andrew and his team made. And they'll, they'll look, I hope, in a decade's time, they'll look incredibly simplistic and almost crude. I really hope they do because then we will have moved on, but we would never get there if we didn't start here. So I get frustrated when people criticize data for being incomplete or inadequate. It's like, do you want anything or not? I feel like we're archeologists brushing away the dust and gradually get, gradually getting a, a clearer picture as the data gradually improves. And you need to, you know, academics need to recognize its shortfall and recognize it inherit flaws and uncertainties and still use it because it's the best information we currently have. Yeah, and we cannot wait 10 years to get the better we data can't. before we act, right? I mean, that's, but it's funny how economic policies, they didn't care about the data, right? They had whatever they wanted and you, you so I had an economic crash course by, by, learn, by reading this book. Uh, I learned so many biases that were by famous uh, tw 20th century uh, and before economists. Uh, that all said, well, it's, uh, you know, if we grow a bit more, things are going to get better, be it Kuznet or be it other people. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, we can't say that we had data before and we acted upon, right? We have some heuristic knowledge. We know that consuming less is better, right? Uh, we know that cities are open and so probably they consume two, three, four, ten times more outside. So even if it's three or five, you can still reduce it, right? I mean, the, there's no, <laughs> we shouldn't wait until we know if it's three or five. We should just start exactly. reducing and we'll see where that gets. Exactly, exactly. That's the direction we need to move in. So I'm excited about this, this kind of data being put together with this kind of picture. Yes. And enabling cities, and there are the kind of policymakers out there who we need who say, yeah, I want to use this as my new city dashboard, as my new national dashboard. Why not? Why not in five years' time, governments around the world standing up against this dashboard and saying, here is what we have achieved over the last year. Here is how we're making progress on eliminating these deprivations for people. 
we certainly have the data for that already. Here's the progress we're making on coming back within planetary boundaries. This is the new metrics to which we hold ourselves accountable. We're not going to stand here and just say it drives growth, growth, growth. We're going to say we are bringing ourselves into thriving balance. And that will be the metrics of the 21st century. And metrics make visible a paradigm and a paradigm changes the future. So I want to ask you uh, another question, which is about you, you, your penultimate, uh, penultimate uh, chapter, the one on be agnostic about growth. Mm -hmm. You finish it about, so you had this whole, how is it going right now, growth? And then are we going to land or are we going to continue to grow? Mm -hmm. And then you, at the very end, you say, welcome to the arrivals lounge. Mm -hmm. And you say that actually the airplane was perhaps not the best metaphor to describe GDP's future journey. And then I was like, wait, what? So you say, <laughs> <laughs> so you said that Rostow should have uh, be introduced to 21st century water sports. And I reckon he should, he would set his heart on kite surfing as far better metaphor for the future of GDP. And then I was mm -hmm. hooked. I was like, so <laughs> why kite surf? Tell me you kite surf. I really wish I could tell you I kite surf and I've uh, never kite surfed. That would be very cool, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm the European kite surfing champion. No, I've never kite surfed, but I've watched kite surfing. And so, so because the airplane is a really sort of binary idea, it goes up and then it comes down. And it, that's just too simplistic. We live in complex systems, uh, just like our bodies, that are constantly needing homeostasis, constantly adapting and jiggling uh, between balancing between the ceiling and the floor, right? And you want to stay between and you have to adapt and, and you're transforming and there might be a wave of transformation and you, you go over a bump of it. And the point isn't, are we going up or down? The point is, this is adjusting. This is adjusting. So, so the, the major dynamics that we want to create, the major things we should be measuring are, are we going from degenerative to regenerative? And are we going from divisive To distributive. These are the big trends that I believe that the 21st century should be judging itself by. Now, what's happening to GDP? GDP is the value of goods and services sold in an economy in a year. That's what it is. It's a fraction of all the things we care about because many things that we care about and give us well being aren't even priced, aren't even in the market. So you can't buy them or sell them. So it's just a slice of it. And, and of course, it tells you something. It tells you about the level of monetized economic activity going on. The big trends we want, like the, the, the horizon we're going towards is regenerative and distributive design. Now, imagine we're on a kite surf, right? So you're juggling with the waves that are rolling beneath you. Let's think of the waves as being the regenerative design where we're, we're moving towards a kind of, you know, these waves of regeneration are happening and it's disruptive. And then there's the winds of change coming through with being more distributive. Think of that sail is opening up, right? Here's, here's my kite surf sail. Whee! Big sail, catch the wind. I don't Now, have my, my kite surf as a prop. I should have. Yeah, you should well. have. Do yeah. you kite? Are you kite yes, surfing? Yes, yes. That's why I, when I read oh that, I was God. like, oh, come on. Next when time we the, meet, yeah. Okay, you teach me. Will you teach me? Yeah, no worries. So, and then tell me I'm getting this all correct, right? So you're juggling the motion of the waves under your board. You're juggling the pull of the wind in your sail. And how do you do that? Because in the middle, you've got a bar and it goes up and down and you pull on your bar up and down to manage the relationship between the wind and the waves. And when I saw that, I thought, that's it. GDP, <laughs> I'm not going to, it's always got to go up. You don't want that bar always going up or down. It, the point is it, it adapts. It becomes an adaptive variable. And you use it to adapt, to use the wind and the waves to get to where you want to go to. So, yeah. So does that work for somebody yeah, who actually yeah, yeah. knows this? Okay. Exactly. You need your lines in tension and your bar is the regulating factor. So there we go. Next time we meet, I hope it's going to be over a beach and... G give, me a, give me a Zoom handshake. Ah, Bam. Wait, the other That's one. It. Yeah. <laughs> I want that kite stuff. Good. Uh, so I generally ask two small questions before the end, which is... What's next? What do you, what's, what's in the, you know, the, the plans for 2021? And, and then, can you swim? Yes, I can swim. Yeah. <laughs> Good. That's going to be helpful for the kite lessons. Uh, and then some books, articles, videos, films, something inspiring that you would like to share. Oh, 
what's in the pipeline for 2021? Well, it's sometimes it's funny. You, you didn't ask me this, but sometimes people say to me, and, and what's your next book going to be? <laughs> and I say, well, I'm not going to write another book until this one's done. And this one ain't done yet. Yeah. So I, I wrote a book as an act of advocacy. I didn't write a book because I wanted to write a book. It just seemed the most effective thing to do next. And now the most effective thing to do is to do Donut Economics Action Lab. And I'm just loving working with these amazing change makers who show up because we never knock on anyone's door. We've never once asked anybody to talk about the donut, use the donut, recommend the donut, never. Why? There's so many ideas out there. Use the ones that make sense to you. So all the people we work with are change makers who've got in touch with us from around the world and said, this is useful to me in my context. And I'm thrilled and motivated every single day by working with those folks. So we are going to be working more in cities and places, global north and south. We're, work we're gonna start working more with businesses and opening that box, and seeing how we can do this well. So I'm really excited about that work that lies ahead. In terms of books I wanna recommend, oh my goodness. Ah, <laughs> I, there's too many. Um, I don't know if they're around by me now. I'm gonna tell, okay, the one book that I read that just really profoundly moved me, and I know it's been moving many, many people, is Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Uh, it's an amazing book that really, actually it takes us back to where this conversation began about the Argentinian talking about Pachamama and the Englishman talking about Western rational science. And Robin Wall Kimmerer is from a First Nations culture in the US, but taught as a, a scientific academic ecologist. And she sits across indigenous knowledge and Western science of ecology of the land. It's, a, it's just a profoundly brilliant book about regeneration of people and land. So that was a really brilliant book. Um, yeah, that's the one I'm going to recommend today. Thanks so much. And thanks as well, everyone, uh, for watching or listening until the end. Um, please share this with other people that will enjoy this. And Kate, we have a, a meeting settled for next time we meet on a beach. We really do. You're on. Okay, great to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Hey, Bye. cheers.